been looking forward to this reading. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our uh, poet tonight, Margaret Maggie Chula, who grew up in Massachusetts on her grandparents' eight-acre farm, playing in the woods and meadows. Her writing and her spiritual values have been shaped by the 12 years that she spent in Japan. So in addition to teaching creative writing in English at Kyoto Seike University and Doshisha Women's College, she also practiced the traditional arts of flower arrangement, woodblock painting, and haiku. Her first book, Grinding My Ink, a selection of haiku written during that period, was awarded a Haiku Society of America Book Award. Her other collections include This Moment, Shadow Lines with Rich Yeomans, Always Filling, Always Full, and The Smell of Rust. Her most recent book, What Remains, Japanese Americans in Internment Camps, is a seven-year collaboration with quilt artist Kathy Erickson and features poems written in the voices of Japanese Americans interred during World War II. Maggie also published poems in Prairie Schooner, Kyoto Journal, Poet Lore, American Review, Windfall, Tiger's Eye, and Runes, as well as numerous haiku journals around the world. Her poems have appeared in Your Daily Poem, and one of her haiku is printed on Itoen tea bottles, sold in stores and vending machines throughout Japan, which is very exciting. <laughs> you have to buy a lot of tea to get yours, though. <laughs> Her awards include fellowships to the Vermont Studio Center, Helene Wurlitzer Foundation, and the Posse in the Woods. Grants from the Oregon Literary Arts and Regional Arts and Culture Council have supported collaboration with artists, musicians, photographers, and dancers. She lives in Portland, where she continues to teach and give workshops at universities, poetry organizations, and Zen centers. You want to have the microphone? Let's uh, try it because I have a musical piece later. You have a musical piece later? So, how was that for volume level? Good. Is that a little better? That's good, yeah. That's better. You can hear better. Okay. Would you join me in welcoming our poet this evening, Margaret Maggie Chula? Thank you, Tom. You know, when I was uh, talking about this reading, I, sa I said to a friend, I'm giving a reading in Milwaukee, and she kind of frowned, and she said, Milwaukee? Wisconsin? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, Milwaukee, Oregon. They sponsor a poet every month to come and read. Um, the Spotlight uh, Venture is just wonderful. I mean. I'm sure Milwaukee, Wisconsin does not have a poetry reading every month. <laughs> so I want to thank the city. I want to thank uh, Tom for doing all the setup work and um, Grady Wheeler also and uh, the town of Milwaukee, of course. So Tom pretty much outlined my life in the introduction, but I'm going to uh, read some of the poems that go along with it. I'm going to start with haiku. I have devoted more than 30 years to studying haiku and teaching it and promoting it because haiku is one of the most misunderstood forms. Most people think it has to be written in five, seven, five syllables, three lines. Well, if you're writing in Japanese, that's true, but in English, it does not have to be so strict. It does need to be short. It needs to be clear simple words. It needs to have a seasonal word. So uh, spring rain, tulips, some indication of a season. And it needs to have um, a, a shift where there's a surprise. So that is the real challenge of, of the haiku is to shift in a way that makes sense um, but also surprises you. Okay. Um, now, Daniel last month talked about, you know, the finger pointing at the moon. Well, there's a quote uh, 
in haiku, it says, if the finger is bejeweled, you are not looking at the moon. You're looking at the finger or at the jewel. And in haiku, we look at the moon. So we keep it very simple and fresh. My first book, Grinding My Ink, is a distillation of thousands of poems I wrote while living in Kyoto. And I have two friends from Kyoto here in the audience. So um, you at least will understand the house that we lived in. We lived in a traditional Japanese house. Very simple, which is probably why I was writing haiku, because our lives were so simple, so refreshingly simple. And, for example, we had, uh, in our kitchen, we had one drawer. Two people could not really move it in the kitchen, if one, one person was filled the kitchen, really. Um, and I think the most um, dramatic example is the toilet. We had an in-house outhouse, <laughs> which means no flush toilet. Um, and let me see. Um, so some of you may have read In Praise of Shadows by Junichiro Tanizaki. If you haven't, it's a fabulous book. He says, quote, the Japanese toilet is truly a place of spiritual repose. There are certain prerequisites, a degree of dimness, absolute cleanliness, and quiet so complete one can hear the hum of a mosquito. From the window, must one must have a beautiful sight. The atmosphere should be pleasant, artistically simple, but tasteful. Now, our toilet was separate from the bath, and I had an indigo fabric draped over the shelf, and I had a little flower arrangement that I changed every few days. Now, in... Uh, Japanese culture, you have chabana, a flower arrangement for the tea ceremony in the tea room. Well, I called mine uh, benjo bana. Bana means flower, and benjo is toilet, so my <laughs> toilet flower arrangement. And then we had a kabuki calendar on the wall, and outside were morning, morning glories uh, going up and down the fence. Once a month, the uh, truck called the honey dipper came to pump out the pit, and we would always they would always arrive when we were having breakfast. <laughs> so that gives you some sense of, of how we lived. Our house was tatami. We had no furniture other than a desk. We had no cell phones. We had no checks even, no checking account. We carried cash. Um, we had no car until the last year or so. We ran around on little motor scooters and bicycles. So that's the background for um, some of these poems. And you know, reading them now, they, they do sound very fresh, um, even though this is such an old book, 1993. Uh, we came here in 92, so. I'm going to read some excerpts from the spring section. Oh, and I do want to say that each section is introduced by a, a sumie ink drawing fold out of the season. So this is hana, which is flower, the kanji. So spring begins in a flurry of activity. Boys running team, the crackle of polyester. Spring cleaning, a white kitten rolls in the dust. Now, there are many kittens in this book. Um, we lived in, on a lane called Gaijin Mura, Foreigner's Village. And for, we were all Westerners, so um, we were very tenderly. So all the Japanese would drop their litters off in Gaiji Mura, knowing that we would take care of the cats, the kittens. So uh, the woman next door um, was the Kuan Yin, the goddess of compassion. She adopted so many kittens and she spayed them, and so we had quite a few kittens running around, which was great. Now, just behind our house were rice fields, and from the back window we could watch the rice cycle from plowing the paddy, flooding the paddy, to planting the rice seedlings to the harvest. And it was wonderful to be so close to nature and see all the cycles without having to go out there and do it. <laughs> <laughs> plowing the paddy, minor birds marching just behind. Now, minor birds are like starlings. In straw mat raincoats, farmers plant rice. 
their boots croaking. By the way, if you would like to hear a poem again, just raise your hand and I'll repeat it. Haiku are like, they're like little dewdrops. I mean, they're, they're the essence of poetry, but they evaporate very quickly. And if you don't catch it the first time, you sometimes miss the poem. So I too had a very small um, urban flower garden. Cow dung, chicken dung, dug into the new garden. The cat adds his own. <laughs> and along with new life, um, there are memories evoked by flowers and the sounds of spring. Smell of Narcissus, my 13th spring, and mother's tumor. 13th, smell of Narcissus, my 13th spring, and mother's tumor. You see that leap? Uh, my mother is alive and well. She's almost 96, so that's, um, that's an old poem. Warbler's song welcomes me home, the prowling cat. Okay. <coughs> now, once um, we moved to America, oh, I want to show you the haiku on the, the tea bottle. I drank the tea already. <laughs> This is the uh, tea bottle, and it's both in Japanese and in English, and it's so tiny that my friends could not... I gave several to my friends, and they could say, so where's your poem? Um, and the poem is, Dusk settles into the rice stubble, a sickle moon. So that, of course, is a play on... They cut the rice with the sickles. So here's the tea bottle. Now, once um, we lived in America for a while. Uh, I continued to write haiku. My husband, John Hall, is a photographer, and he was taking pictures around the Pearl District, and he found this beautiful remnant of a building they had torn down. And so I named the book after the photograph, The Smell of Rust. There's also a poem that, that relates to that. Let's see. End of summer. The rust on my scissors smells of marigolds. End of summer. The rust on my scissors smells of marigolds. So you see, these are a little different. These are, some of these are kind of sassy or humorous, tongue-in-cheek, satirical. And there is actually a name for that form. It's called senryu. S-E-N-R-Y-U. And those are the three-line poems. May or may not have nature in them, but they're generally comical. Sultry afternoon. In Grandma's junk mail. Fredericks of Hollywood. <laughs> Breaking my diet with mocha fudge ice cream. Hole in the cone. <laughs> Nursing home. She rubs my lipstick kiss into her cheeks. Impossible to add to its beauty, yet light on the peony. My favorite summer flower. This moment is all cracks in the stone Buddha. This moment is all cracks in the stone Buddha. Days lengthen. The amaryllis topples under its own weight. I'm sure many of you have had that experience. Dreaming of you, this morning molehills erupt from the lawn. <laughs> What's wonderful about haiku is you can take it any way you want. You can bring your own experience to it and everyone will have a different interpretation. Okay. Chickens no longer dash to the compost, dregs of Chinese herbs. Chickens no longer rush 
to the compost dregs of Chinese herbs. From the porch glider, the smell of jasmine, he turns off the light. From the porch glider, the smell of jasmine, he turns off the light. Okay, so haiku have a little mystery in them. And these haiku may be even more so because they're, these were written at, at, a, at a various tea ceremonies that I attended both in Japan and here in Portland. We have several tea schools. And I don't study tea, but I just go there as a guest, and I love to be in that small room and being served tea, and it just it feels like going back to Japan, that, that spirit and that tranquility in the room. So uh, cha no yu is the way of tea. And in 1800, Buddhist monks went to China from Japan to study, and they brought back tea to keep them awake during meditation. Uh, Sen no Rikyu is the most famous tea master, and he made a tea uh, a spiritual path. He refined it, and that was in the mid-1500s. So tea became the ideal of simplicity and poverty, even though some of the tea bowls were very expensive. Um, here are a just a few from that. The iron kettle begins to sing, wind in the pine trees. This is a, a tea whisk, a chasen. Um, once again, this book was designed around this uh, woodblock print by my woodblock teacher in Japan, Richard Steiner. And this is a beautiful, if you haven't seen it, it's made out of bamboo, just slivered and made into this whisk. Whisking tea. Pale afternoon sun slants through the shoji. Crunch of footsteps on the rain-soaked gravel. Bullfrog croaks. <coughs> this is written in the Japanese garden. Crunch of footsteps on the rain-soaked gravel. Bullfrog croaks. You see how the sounds also really amplify the, the haiku? What you can do in just three short lines. <coughs> Tea gathering. An ant climbs onto the water ladle. <laughs> Tea gathering. An ant climbs onto the water ladle. Earth and water fired into a tea bowl. Froth of green. I feel like I'm going through all the Japanese poetic forms today, um, tonight. The next one is an anthology that I was very pleased to be invited to contribute to, 10 Japanese and American women writing on this temple, Tokeji. Tokeji is thousands of years old. It was started in 1285, and it was a safe haven for Japanese women to run to. It's called the Divorce Temple because they did not have divorce, but if they were being abused, life was too difficult, mother-in-law, uh, then they had this place to run to. And if they stayed here three years, then they were free. So many of them stayed and became nuns. Uh, several did return to their families, not their husbands, but their... And they left children behind, so it was, it was an act of desperation. But in this temple, there's this beautiful um, Kuan Yin, a, a goddess of compassion. Her name is uh, the Water Moon Kanon, or Sui Getsu in Japanese. This is the image that I used to write. We had to write something about this temple. And I imagined all these women going into the temple and, write, and looking up at her beseechingly and telling their stories. So I wrote in the voices of three women from different eras of Japan. And the form is haibun, which is uh, a poem mixed with prose. 
The poem is not a haiku, it's a tanka, which is a five-line poem. Tanka are much more emotional, so I use that form for obvious reasons. Okay, this woman is uh, Chiyo in the Taisho era, 1925, fairly recent. As I climb the stairs of Tokeji Temple, I gaze at hydrangeas, lavender and deep purple, like the welts on my body. We lost everything in the great Kanto earthquake of 1923. Our home, our restaurant in the Ginza, burned to the ground. We had put all our efforts into succeeding, and now there was nothing. Like beggars, Kenji and I fled to a village in the mountains and moved in with his parents. There we lived a life of drudgery, planting rice, pulling radishes, plowing fields. My mother-in-law made my life miserable with her nagging and criticism, and there was nothing I could do. Shikata ganai, it can't be helped. Every night, Kenji drank sake to drown his anger and shame. And when he was drunk, he took out his humiliation on me. All night in the old farmhouse, those beatings and curses, I spit out the bitter seeds of pomegranates. I also wanted to read a, um, a high boon about our travels. Um, John and I traveled around the world, overland through Asia, when, uh, oh, 1977 through 1979, 1980, another lifetime. Um, we spent a lot of time in countries. Some of the countries we went to you can no longer go to. This is a poem about um, Afghanistan in Herat which was one of the most beautiful kind of medieval villages you can imagine. Um, and most of you probably know mosques in Afghanistan have minarets, the tall towers, from which the muezzin calls the faithful to prayer uh, three times a day, or five times a day, beginning at dawn. So we always often wake to that very loud sound calling to prayer. Um, so this is Herat, 1977. Dust settles. I forgive the thief who broke into our room at the Hotel Bezad and stole our duffel bag. I forgive him because time has passed and I am still alive and he most likely is not. John and I were inexperienced travelers then and had packed all our valuables in that bag and closed it with a padlock. Cameras, Nikon lenses, binoculars, and medications. Soon after the robbery, I came down with dysentery. I laid on my bunk, covered with a torn blanket, rising only to drag myself to the filthy toilet down the hall. My temperature climbed to 104 degrees. I cursed the man who had stolen our antibiotics. For three days, I fasted and hallucinated and thought about where I would be buried. But on October 10th, my 30th birthday, the fever broke. Rising from my sick bed, I walked to the veranda and raised my hands to the sky. The sun was shining. The next day, we would head overland across the desert to Mazari Sharif. Muslim call to worship. The jingle of horse carts, dust settles. Yeah, we went to Mazari Sharif before anyone knew, ever heard of that word. It was an amazing trip. And, you know, the joys of traveling. You know, when you go to these third world countries and you're on your own. Okay, this is a, an also a wonderful uh, collection of, of haibun, prose and haiku, put out by White Pine Press called The Unswept Path. And I'm going to read you, uh, I did a 
several of these, uh, Tales of a Paper Lantern, Seasons in a Japanese House. So you get to experience uh, fireflies in Japan. Firefly Lanterns. In early June, we get a telephone call from Muriyama-san, our potter friend from Ayabe. Meggy, he always called me Meggy. Meggy, he says, the fireflies are out. Okay, I say, we'll be right up. Ayabe is a two and a half hour drive from Kyoto along a rural highway that meanders through mountain villages. John and I pack an overnight bag and leave right after our university classes finish. Muriyama-san, his wife Ayako, and 10-year-old daughter Tomoko greet us warmly outside their old farmhouse. Though we are the best of friends, we call him by his surname. So does his wife. Ayako prepares a simple meal of tofu, fish, and garden vegetables. As soon as it gets dark, we gather nets and glass jars and head outside. It's a remarkably clear night for tsuyu, rainy season. Stars, stars' reflections, mirrored in the paddy field. Oh, the fireflies. Stars, stars' reflections, mirrored in the paddy field. Oh, the fireflies. They land on the grasses bordering the rice fields and on the hotaru bukuro, the white bell flowers that thrive in the damp soil. Tomoko plucks a bell flower for me and explains that hotaru means firefly and bukuro is sack. With our butterfly nets, we scoop the air and capture a net full of fireflies. Carefully, we transfer them to the hotaru bukuro by opening the blossoms and inserting the fireflies into their petal soft cage. Soon the flowers begin to take on the glow of the fireflies' light. By the end of the hour, we have a handful of lanterns to guide our way home. Other fireflies are contained in jars. How many do we have? 50? 100? It's impossible to count them with their lights flickering on and off, on and off. At the farmhouse, we remove our shoes and gather in the main room, settling down on the tatami. Muriyama-san goes outside to his kiln and selects some sake cups from a recent firing. He presents each of us with a pristine cup and fills it with sake. Kampai, he toasts. Kampai, we echo, raising the smooth cups to our lips. Our host closes all the fasuma doors to the rest of the house, then opens the lids on the glass jars releasing the fireflies into the room. Tomoko and I peel back the petals of the hotaru bukuro and coax our captives from their silken cages. They dart and flick, flash their green lights as they settle on arms and knees and on the Japanese scroll in the alcove. Lying on tatami in a room full of fireflies, the evening cool, Lying on tatami in a room full of fireflies, the evening cool. In the darkened room, we drink sake and talk softly, speak of gentle things, the importance of friendship, the natural abundance of life. For hours, we lie on the tatami whispering as night deepens and the sake bottle empties. On the ceiling, the stars flicker on and off, on and off. When it's finally time to retire, Muriyama-san opens the shoji and releases the fireflies into the night. By morning, they will have scar scattered far and wide, specks of darkness against the overcast sky. Happy memories. Another artist, wonderful artist uh, locally, Jeff Gunn, uh, read the manuscript and said, yeah, I'd like to do some artwork for you for your, to illustrate your poems. He sent all of these to me, a big sheet full of them, 
And I said, well, what poems do they go with? And he said, you decide. Now, that's a collaboration. <laughs> when I can just pair them any way I want. Uh, it was just wonderful. Always feeling, always full. Uh, tanka, I, I just love doing tanka. I have continued, I've pretty much stopped haiku, but tanka, things in nature and things in, in our lives, how they inter intersect, and they do, and you'll see from these poems how they can be brought together. So it's a five-line poem. These were written 1,200 years ago by people in the courts, the aristocrats who were educated, written by women. Some of you know Asei Shonagon and Murasaki Shikibu. These are the women who wrote these uh, poems. They were called Waka back then, W-A-K-A. Uh, so you, you'll see, I think, the, the link between the emotion and the, the nature, something happening in a nature, nature element or scene. The black negligee that I bought for your return hangs in my closet. Day by day, plums ripen and are picked clean by birds. Here's, uh, these are divided into various sections. These are, these are the love poems. From inside the fog, we listen to ospreys call to each other, then row back in silence, our knees just touching. From inside the fog, we listen to ospreys call to each other, then row back in silence, our knees just touching. My friends tell me that they are breaking up. I stand at the sink, rinse the cloudy rice over and over again. My friends tell me that they are breaking up. I stand at the kitchen sink, rinse the cloudy rice over and over again. Japanese say you should rinse the rice three times. How unfair that dormant flower bulbs come back to life every spring, first spring, without you. How unfair that dormant flower buds come back to life every spring, first spring, without you. And here are some new ones. This one actually won a prize, um, Tonka Society of America prize. Uh, there is a Tonka Society of America in, in, uh, in the US with 500 or so members. And um, I just began my, <laughs> my role as president. So I'm just learning what it's like to be on a board with people scattered all over the states and all over the world. And we, there is a wonderful journal that's, that's published. So. Um, and then a concert, a concert, a contest um, every year. Hush of crickets from familiar trees. We leave our home of 17 years without fanfare. Hush of crickets from familiar trees. We leave our home of 17 years without fanfare. Yesterday's desires, what were they? A vase without flowers holds only itself. It's kind of a Daniel Sketch Mills poem. <laughs> it's like the, the Tao. <laughs> the vase is the Tao, holds only itself. Walking the path through the dark garden, moonlight shines on the flower with no scent. It's a kind of a Buddhist poem. Walking the path through the dark garden, moonlight shines on the flower with no scent. This is not a Buddhist poem. This morning, as you loosened my silk kimono, I heard the songbirds of 20 summers. This morning, as you loosened my silk kimono, I heard the songbirds of 20 summers. I have a new manuscript of Tanka. It's all set out on my floor in my study, about 100 Tanka, about this big. It's 
you know, it's a good size. You can set them all out and rearrange them. So that's in process. Okay. Now, um, oh, the poster fell down. Well, stay up for a few minutes. This is uh, the image of the quilt. In uh, 2002, the uh, Washington State Contemporary Quilt Art Association started a project entitled Visual Verse, Poetry Meets Fabric, a collaboration between a quilt artist and a poet, and people paired up all over the country. Well, I'd never done a collaboration with a quilt artist, and you know, I worked with musicians, dancers, artists, photographers. So I said, "Yeah, I'm in. Let's let's try it." So this woman Googled me, Kathy Erickson, and she showed me her a photograph of her quilt, which wasn't quite finished yet. But when I saw that quilt, I just fell in love with these fabrics because they're both um, kind of American fabrics and Japanese. These are autumn flowers in here, and these are taken, say, from kimonos and Japanese fabrics. So I said, yes, let's do, let's do a one-time, one-time uh, project. And so I looked at that, and I thought about who, who would put those pieces together and in what circumstances. And I thought about my grandmother, all our grandmothers who made braided rugs, who recycled our old rags and made them into beautiful things. Quilts, um, rugs. And then I went down to the um, poetry stones on the Willamette River and saw the poems written by Japanese Americans in the internment camps. So I linked those up. I also felt that I, I feel part Japanese and I feel part American, and I'm, sometimes one ascends and the other. other. It's, it's very hard after living so long in another country to really feel an American again. So this quilt really resonated with, with that feeling, Japanese and American. So now if you looked at that quilt, many of you are poets, what would you write about? You would probably not write about the internment camp. So that's the joy of collaboration. You, you bring to it your own experiences. So I'm going to read the poem that accompanies this. Um, all of these poems are persona poems written in the voice of another person. I wanted to give voice to various people in the camps, children, old people, men, women, artists. And we did ten, ten poems and ten quilts, one for each of the internment camps. Each poem is set in a different uh, location. Each poem is written in a different form. So I used letters, I used diary, um, I used tanka. So there's a great variety, which is what I was, I was going for. What remains? They loaded us onto trucks bound for the camps, took our homes, our possessions, our land, just because we were Japanese, Japanese Americans. Two suitcases were all we were allowed for clothes, photos, keepsakes. Twenty years of our lives in America. Your grandfather was taken right off his fishing boat. I was cooking the evening meal when they came. Your mother sat at the kitchen table, studying for a test. That night I cut strips of cloth from garments I had to leave behind, and from them I sewed this quilt, each stitch a remembrance, each square, rectangle, a tribute to nature's bounty in the desolation of Heart Mountain. I stitched in the comfort of Kasuri, the smell of wood smoke on rain-black nights, of days when rain fell soft and even as my child's breath. I stitched in triangles of flowers from my wedding kimono. And as I quilted, I whispered their names. Kiku, Hagi, Kikyo, Chrysanthemum, Bush Clover, Chinese Bellflower. How cheerful those curtains of plumeria, hibiscus that hung in our bedroom, their perfume a dream of Hawaii. 
I sewed in beauty and vertical rays of yellow, the sun that shone through the barbed wire and the curtainless windows of our barracks. The orange poppies were last, fashioned from your mother's hair ribbons. I planted them as an afterthought, question marks, blooming with hope. Okay, I'm just going to read one more. This is a fabulous quilt. It's double-sided. It's called Bunny Dreams. And it's taken from a photograph of evacuation from Bainbridge Island. And it's a very famous photograph. Um, there's a mother carrying a little bunny for her, for her little son. They could only take what they could carry, but she felt that that little bunny was important, was going to be important for her son. So... Uh, bunny dreams. I was uh, reading a lot about, uh, well, first-hand experience, uh, memoirs and uh, books about the internment. And one book um, really uh, affected me. It was about about animals. I mean, children and families had to leave their pets behind. When you think about it, what would you do if you were going away, didn't know when you were coming back or if you were coming back? So one mother uh, in this story killed her, the dog while the children were at school and buried it in the backyard. And I found that um, so, so poignant. So that was, that's one thing that will come into this, um, this story. The other thing is Neko is a is cat in Japanese, Neko. And Usagi is rabbit in Japanese. This is written in the form of a letter. Over the moon. Dear Jack, I'm here at Tule Lake. They call it a camp, but it's not like that summer camp we went to where we rode on the lake and roasted marshmallows. There's no lake anywhere, just dust. It blows in my eyes and stings. I have to sleep in the same room with my mom and dad on hard cots, and there's no hamburgers or ice cream here, just potatoes and lots of soup. I miss my school friends, and sometimes I even cry, especially when I think about Neko and Usagi. You remember Neko, my yellow cat? We gave her to the lady next door. She said, I hope your Japanese cat gets along with my American cat. I hope so, too. No one would take Usagi, even when I changed his name to Rabbit. On the day we left, Mama er told me I had to let him go free, so we took him outside and opened his cage. But he just sat there. He didn't want to leave his home either. Finally, Mama tipped over the cage, and he hop-hopped away into the bushes. Last night, I couldn't sleep. The coyotes were making awful scary noises but I snuck out of our barrack anyway. It was so bright with a big moon shining. I went over to the barbed wire fence and I was looking up at the sky when guess what I saw? Two rabbits jumping over the moon. It was Usagi and his new friend Rabbit. I was so happy to see him again, I yelled, Usagi, down here! And you know what? He turned around and looked right at me. Just like that day, that last day before he ran away. I waved at him and started to laugh. But then the big spotlight came on, and I ran back to my bed before they could shoot me. Your friend, Eddie Matsui. <laughs> This project took seven years. Um, just a caution. <laughs> we'll just start doing a collaboration. <laughs> okay, just a couple more. Um, some of you know, but uh, many of you don't, that chamber, Friends of Chamber Music in Portland, Oregon has a poet laureate. 
you. That's me. <laughs> I got a call from the executive director, Pat Zaglow, uh, last summer, and she said, I have a proposition for you. I think you'll like this. It's very unusual. And I said, great. She said, I was going online, and I noticed that Wimbledon has a poet laureate. Wimbledon, OK. <laughs> so <laughs> she said, if Wimbledon can have one, then certainly we can have one. So she asked me if I'd be interested, and I said, well, what do I have to do? And just go to a concert, every concert of the season, and write one poem. And I've done that before. I think many of us, we, we get stimulated by music, and we start jotting things down, and we see images when we're listening to music. So that's what I did. And of course, I didn't write just one poem. I wrote you know, four or five every concert. Um, and at the end of the season, I realized I had 41 poems <laughs> that I had written. It's a real, um, it's very exciting just to sit there in the dark with your little, little flashlight and scribble ideas, images emotions that come from music. Um, so I'm going to read one of these, and just for a change of scene, I, I chose uh, Shostakovich. And if you know, this is not, um, this is not haiku here. This is, <laughs> this is music from, from the war and from poverty and brutality. And uh, so... We're going to, um, this is from Shostakovich, Quartet Number 8 in C minor. Yeah, so. And I do have... <laughs> Reluctant to part. Square heeled boots clatter on cobblestones. Steel gray uniforms. Cylinders of death point skyward. No bird sounds. Just the squeal of bats spiraling in for the kill. Their gunmetal wings. Run, 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 run. A girl escapes in terror. The red streak of her dress, a flag, a badge, a bandage. Behind the door, fear trembles in a trench coat. Knock, knock, knock. Dishes shatter, dust spews from beneath the armoire. All is lost, he has been found. The woman twists a dish rag in her hands. Stench of cabbage taste of blood. She bites her lip hard. Winter chill breaks through the lace curtains.
Well, there was a lot of Shostakovich and, and very intense music, so I thought I would write, I would portray death in a little different way. So I'm going to read the, the broadside poem, Death is a Butterfly. And I, I don't have that music. Um, it's not published yet, I don't think. This was written at a Takash Quartet. If you ever have a chance to see them, to hear them, they're absolutely wonderful. And the piece is uh, Soft Sleep Shall Contain You by Daniel Kellogg. Death is a butterfly that lands on her shoulder, its delicate wings a pool of color that seeps into the maiden's skin through the silk threads of her gown. She is joyful at being chosen unties her bonnet and tosses it into the air. Her small dog chases the ribbon, trickling like water across the garden. A thrumming from the butterfly, death is becoming impatient. The maiden feels its breath on her slender white neck, its exhalation of clover, Lepidoptera, lifts the maiden by her ringlets, her body light and willing as mist. She rises toward the light, full flounced, singing a single note of farewell to her little dog, chewing on the ribbon of her abandoned bonnet. Thank you. Questions? I was waiting for that Shostakovich where, you know, he repeats the thump, 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 yeah. Boy, if that doesn't tear, tear your heart out, nothing else will. Yeah. Every time you hear it, I mean, it's, you go through the same emotional experience. Right. You really feel like you're being chased oh, and, and you're going to be man, killed, yes, slaughtered. Live it all yeah. Over well, he lived time. that, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's very moving. Yeah. It's wonderful to write poetry to it. Yeah. Of course, these are written over, I mean, some of these have three or four movements, you know, oh, yeah. so it's hard to just take an excerpt and, I mean, I write over the period of maybe 15 minutes, um, so, but you get the feeling, it's the emotion, and, and I'm trying to have the words actually echo the music, uh, some of the sounds of the words in the, in the um, run, 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 you know, the staccato. <coughs> What's your writing practice? Oh, my practice. <laughs> oh, my practice is to go away somewhere, quiet or different, and write like crazy. I um, I go through periods where I just write and write, and then I go through periods when I set up programs and and you know do po biz. I guess it's called po po biz poetry business. And any of us who are artists and poets, we, we know that we spend, you know, a large percentage of our time setting up things, um, talking to people, uh, correcting people, uh, looking for new places to read or perform. So that, that takes up a lot of, a lot of time. So my practice is whenever I, I, I go outside every day, I do go outside every day and, and look at things. That's just part of being a poet. So my practice is being outdoors as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, saw uh, an, an email from a haiku group in Japan in English <coughs> that you, you had uh, brought Stephen Gill. Yes, yeah. Stephen. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering what poem that was. Was it the poem that you read tonight earlier for winning a prize? Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't read that one. No, this was, a, this was about a, a dream I had. Uh, being possessed by dolls and then seeing the doll when I woke up. So it was kind of a creepy, creepy thing. I didn't <laughs> want to read that. I'm one of the few women, uh, girls, as a girl, I, I was terrified of horses and I hated dolls. I thought dolls were spirits and evil and they'd come alive. And There's actually a doll in, in Japan at a temple, um, Hokyoji. 
doll temple in Japan where they have displays of dolls, and this one doll's hair is reputed to be growing. So that fit right into to my experience of dolls. <laughs> yeah. So do you ever go back to Japan? Well, when I get invited back to a conference, um, that seems to be when we go back, and uh, I love going back. I just love, It feels like coming home. Um, of course, our house is gone. That house is just that we lived in has been leveled, and brand new homes and garages have been put where rice fields were. And so we go back. We have a lot of friends there. Um, we do have a place to stay. Um, there's a doshisha where both of us taught has a guest house, so we we get to stay there. Beautiful place. But you know, the yen is 82 to a dollar, so the dollar 82 cents to 100 yen, so it's just um, very expensive to go back right now. And, uh, you know, of course, we're, we didn't have any friends affected by the tsunami and the earthquake, but, of course, our heart goes out to all these people. <laughs>